This one's gonna be tough. This one's gonna be tough. Uh, okay, let's get one under here. Get rid of this one. Take this one out. Hold on, hold on. Let's let me let me go backwards. I'm just gonna go over to there. Right here. Yeah. You can go but I can go backwards and then turn and go straight. So go down a little bit and then straight. That's the that's the trail right there, right? Yeah. Just the trail here. Yeah, but I don't think we're gonna make this part is the issue. I could try you. So, okay, the other thing is push it in hard and then yeah. and yeah. then low. Because the thing is, at the start, it's really hard. I don't think I'm going to get on that. Yeah, just one, just one. Just one, two of them. Okay, okay. Let's just keep going. Oh, where do we want to go? my back skiing 20 years ago and I didn't really know what to think at that point. I, you know, there's a part of me that thought my life was over and there was another part of me that didn't want to think that at all. I think Chris has changed since his accident, certainly not his personality. He was always, as a young kid from the time he could talk and walk, thinking about what goal he had in mind, how he could achieve that, and how he could be the best at what he wanted to do. I don't think he ever felt he needed to be better than anybody else. He just wanted to do what he thought was going to be the top of the limit. My greatest moment in sport was winning the downhill in Lillehammer. I was in the most disabled of the three classes. I mean, literally had significantly fewer muscles, no real sitting balance muscles to deal with. And, and I beat all the guys in the race that day. And that's, that for me was a representation of doing things that nobody thought were possible. And I think that what that does is it just breaks some of those beliefs. I didn't want to be disabled. I didn't want to be in that category. And if I could keep exceeding people's expectations or keep forcing them to change their expectations, it would change their perception of me. And, and I always hoped that it was a there was a more global thing as well. That it wasn't just me. <laughs> Thank you.
Chris had retired from his competing in skiing and in wheelchair track, and I knew he had a challenge brewing inside of him. He was writing a book. He was trying to promote the ability of people with disabilities, and he was doing very well with that, but I knew he still had a physical challenge left in him. I don't have a sense of what, where he came from with the uh, Kilimanjaro, climbing Kilimanjaro. It, it just, you know, all of a sudden he said, well, this is something that I'm going to do. This is something I'm going to attempt to do. So, no, I, 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 I don't know where a lot of Chris's ideas come from. Really don't. When I first started thinking about climbing Kilimanjaro, people kept saying, so why are you doing this? Why do you want to do it? What's the reason? What's the purpose? And I kept thinking, well, I want it to be about shining a light back on the, on the disabled community. And I wanted to do that because as an athlete, I was a little bit different than a lot of other disabled people. It was, the barrier was broken. You watch me go 70 miles an hour on skis, it sort of forces you to kind of look at like, wow, I don't know if I get it. You might not be quite as disabled as I first thought you were. And as a result, I felt a responsibility to represent those people, especially as I became better as an athlete. When I retired, I wasn't in the public eye at all. There was a lot of work left to do, and I feel like to a, to a large extent that people with physical disabilities are the final minority. And it's a minority that's really kind of forgotten in a lot of ways because it's such a disparate group. It represents every racial, ethnic, socioeconomic group out there that is essentially kept down by our assumptions. And, and, and the assumptions are that, well, you're, you're limited. You're limited physically. And, and that means that effectively you're less of a person. Kilimanjaro certainly wasn't my idea, but when he told me about it, I thought it was a great idea. But I guess something I told Chris in the early days, I, you know, if you're going to set something up, the true success of setting something up is that it lives beyond you. And I think that's the goal. I think he's, you know, we've got to work to create something that other people embrace, other people get involved in. And, um, you know, if, if something happens or Chris decides to move on to something else, you would hope that we've established a solid footing, something that can go on and keep doing some good. I think my first thought was that I spend all my time in the mountains climbing stuff and having fun and Chris has always been limited somewhat to things that are wheelchair accessible or that he can do in that manner, ski or whatever. And so my first impulse was that that's one of the greatest ideas I've ever heard. Which is one of the things here. I, mean, you see that. I think he was looking to do something um, that was above and beyond anything he'd done, but then also something that had a catchy or would kind of get interest going so that there was a, a really good goal for him to go after. It's what they call a walkable mountain. It's the tallest mountain in Africa. They call it the, the roof of Africa, 19,340 feet, the tallest freestanding mountain in the world. It's five different climate zones. You start in a, in a tropical rainforest. You go through high desert and end on a glacier. So the obstacles are huge. You get the expanse of rocks, up at the top, you get the cone with the scree, and obviously wheels are, are a huge issue as far as that's concerned. And, and so there's just, there's so many different obstacles in looking at that. And that to me is, is what's appealing because the reason you climb a mountain is to be challenged. the way up you should be able to do it. Yeah.
thing. The first two vehicles were a three-wheeled vehicle and a, and a four-wheeled vehicle that Mike Oxberger at One Off Titanium developed. Some of the most amazing things I've ever seen. A video of a guy doing this all over in a skate park. You know, the swooping concrete. Right. And it's like this all the time. Everywhere he goes, it's like this. But he's doing it. So I always wanted to make my own hand cycle. And I was always more interested in mountain bikes than road bikes. So it made sense to make a off-road hand cycle. It, and I, I would, this configuration always seemed fairly obvious to me. Rear wheel drive, two wheels in front, one in back. Not a recumbent riding position. We took his technology and tweaked it a little bit. And we tweaked it based on conversations that Dave Penny and I had as we were going up a variety of different mountains throughout the West or whatever. But we would go and we'd just have conversations. Well, what do you think if we change this? What do you think if we change that? I think it's a huge challenge. Um, but of all the mountains that you can choose from out there, it seems like Kilimanjaro is probably the right one. I think that the trail is conducive for this. <laughs> Other people See, have attempted to do it that. with hand crank vehicles. All right, push. Yeah, give me a little lift. Okay, you go, 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 go. You got it. Nice. Good effort. Yeah. That's a step, but that's the winch, you see? But then you could, you just keep going. Right, yeah. Maybe give it one try or whatever you want to do, and then we throw the winch line out. Right. In a way, you, you know, you're, you're under your own power again. It's a great joy for me to help him to accomplish a goal like this, because it's gonna take a lot of time. It could take a year and a half of training and preparation and climbing to reach his goal, and maybe not reach the goal. We took that four-wheeled one, and we made it narrower, so it'd fit on the trail better. We made it considerably shorter. We shortened the wheelbase by 13 inches, which I think is one of the more significant things that we did. So, so we brought the rear wheels pretty much right underneath my hips, which means that almost all of my weight was going directly into those wheels. What that did is it greatly enhanced our, our efficiency. For, when, when, I, when I pedal, if, if I break traction at all, it totally drains all of the energy out of me. Commonly, people who have never been in a wheelchair don't have any idea how hard it is to get around in a wheelchair. I mean, if you're in a basketball court or a, a schoolroom, it's, it's okay, it's fine, it's kind of fun. But not if you have a curb, or not if you're trying to get across a, a grassy lawn. The front casters are small, they want to dig into the ground. Every downhill has to be in a wheelie. And that means your hand has to grip just the right amount on the push rim, and you have to do both hands, because otherwise you'll turn if you're in a wheelie. And it's really a lot of skill involved. The average person, I'm always amazed, they say, oh, look, there's a wheelchair ramp, no problem. But have you ever tried to go up a wheelchair ramp in a wheelchair? The average uh, you know, four or five stair height can tire your arms right out. So it, it takes a, someone who's tried it for a while to realize how the phrase, where he lives, a wheelchair is completely useless, is quite true. It, you might not even bother to take your wheelchair out the front door. It'd be good inside if you have a big enough house. But to try to go outside, if you live on a bumpy dirt road, which uh, millions and millions of people do, unlike around here in the US, where there's curb cuts, wheelchair vans that lower themselves down with a special low entry way, and that's not gonna work in most of the world. And if you can't walk, what you need is an off-road hand cycle. If you wanna leave the house, you need an off-road hand cycle.
The last thing we needed to do before we went to the mountain was to pick up Tajiri. And Tajiri had been a porter on the mountain. He'd worked with our African guide service. He'd actually lost his leg on the mountain. First time we met him, we all fell in love with his story, the idea of an African of Tajiri coming back and reconnecting with the mountain with us. But I wasn't convinced that he could do it. And it seemed like Tajiri had given up. Thank you very much. So what do you expect to, to be on, what do you expect you're feeling when you're on the mountain or you're feeling when you get to the top of the mountain? He'll be very excited. He'll feel very, very excited. What about returning? Like after, you know, after, after everything? He'll be very, very happy. Yeah. Does, it, does he think that if he does it with us and, and does it on his new prosthetic, does he think that people will look at him differently? Mm -hmm. And now, what about, you said you're strong, okay. now, you're strong, you're fit, you're ready, because we're talking about maybe climbing, and so with the new leg, are you, will you be ready? Um, I wish, I wish, <laughs> yeah, I wish you were going to be ready. Yeah, he's ready. Yeah. You'll be ready. You'll be ready? Yeah, okay. sure. For him, the upper mountain is going to be the biggest challenge. He's going to spend more time than we would just walking up and down, and it's going to be at 18 to 19,000 feet. So that's another unknown that we'll we'll see how he does. We are taking extra time so he can either rest or acclimatize. So he's set up for success. When we first started, we had, we had that brand new rig. And I was in first gear, like first or second gear, right off the bat, and we're still on the pavement. And I'm going along, and I'm like, Dave, I don't know if I can do this. I really, I'm gonna be in big trouble when we get up top, I don't have enough gear. I, I don't think I'm gonna be able to push this over when we get on the, on the top stuff. And he's like, oh, well, just, just figure it out and we'll see. I'm getting a much better understanding now of what the vehicle and Chris can do. So for us, we might walk through somewhere and it's easy. And you, if you're not thinking about it from his perspective, from Chris's perspective, it was an easy walk. But when we get there, if there's two rocks too close together that are three feet high, that's impassable for him. And <laughs> Mawaki, 
na baada ya tatizo kutokea kwamba ndivyo ambapo nilikuwa nategemea ndio kazi ambayo nguvu kwa sababu sikuwa na direction aina yote ya kazi ambayo ingeweza kufanya hayo kwa sasa hivi labda itokee tofauti labda kwa hapo baada ya tatizo kutokea ni kwamba nitegemeza labda nipate ambayo ya ziada labda nipate msaada tofauti na hapo sintaweza kujikimu katika maisha ambayo labda ambayo niko nayo the very first day made it the first 2000 feet of vertical in 2 hours say the next 1000 feet of vertical took about you know four and a half hours we're about halfway to to camp and that was two hours up the trail, so maybe we'll, we'll just see. I don't. I mean, it it could be three hours still to camp, which would give us a five-hour day, which would still be ahead of my predictions. So. Okay. I'm gonna play with the chain and then put the winch on. We've tested it, I've been on the winch, but tested is a bit of a, it's a bit misleading. I haven't really done much on the winch. Uh, I've climbed one hill. So, some big questions on the winch. Yeah. Yeah, this will be a determining factor. Yeah, it's just interesting to see. I mean, I knew I could do that. Fine. This, we'll see. Jumbo. Jumbo. Oh yeah, it's freaking wet. <laughs> See, how'd you do it? No, I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> oh, that old excuse. It wasn't on purpose. Yep. One, two, three. No, no. This one. No. No, 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 no. no. Up. There you go. Okay. You're in. I'm in? Yeah. And what the winch would do is it would take the two wheel drive vehicle, because it was two back wheel drive, and it would turn it into kind of like a front wheel drive vehicle. So I could, I, by pedaling, I could climb this fixed rope. I could pull myself up the rope. And by pulling me along, I didn't have to have the traction on the rocks. And that was often one of the most difficult parts. Okay, you can, you might want to pull slack, but. Hmm. Winch on. Well, you're not in first gear. If we get it first, we can play with it. But let's just see how the winch does. Okay. That's really the. Yeah, do you and right don't now? wrap the knot in here, we'll stop and... Okay. I think climbing's one of those sports that there's many different ways to climb a mountain. Uh, you can climb it a jumar on the rope and ascend the rope, which is fine. That's the ethics that the people use, like Everest. With Chris, he's trying to do it under his own power. So that's just riding on the vehicle and hand cranking. And then with the winch, I'm going to just take the winch out and fix that to a point, and then he's back under his own power. So I'm not assisting in any way except to give him an anchor point that he can then feel comfortable with to get himself up the mountain. retrospect it's funny because we broke out the winch after lunch and we're like oh look this winch is gonna work and then we realized how slow it was gonna be yeah. okay. and we actually never used it again until we got up on the wow. very steep stuff up on the mountains because the boards were the fastest just taking the boards around balancing them on the rocks and Chris going up the boards was the best way we had two by eight eight foot long boards and I could use those to kind of bridge gaps or to ramp over, over certain rocks or certain formations. 
Chris is in great shape. He's he's doing really well. Um, the technology is probably still the weak link, but so far so good. Um, we'll just keep our fingers crossed. I don't know what hut you're in. Wheelchair. Yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. Good job, buddy. Good job. Good job. Good job. How is it? Good to be back. Kajuro was kidding you. Just like. I'm just trying to be patient, otherwise I'll just leave Chris today. <laughs> I say, what? You don't know him. On the way down, he's going to be. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he's going to be on the back. Yeah. <laughs> go, go. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tajiri has a big changes for sure. Because losing the leg is completely um, losing some opportunity in your lifetime. And Tajiri has been this person who is believe that he can work hard on climbing and make his life good. So from there, he was kind of give up that, um, you know, what's going to follow. And, well, what he did is actually, and what I've been trying to encourage him to do is to accept the way he is now and not to lose. He has to encourage himself on the new kind of life he's going to face. Actually, it helps the patient to go up uphill. Because when the patient goes uphill, when he bears weight, it's like the foot slightly does it flexes. And when he goes down the hill, it's like the foot slightly plant of flexes. So it gives him easy time. But with, with this one, when you are going uphill, when you are going downhill, actually the foot will not be in total contact with the, with the ground. Oh, Chris and I go back to about 1988, I believe. We started school in the fall, and uh, Chris and I got to know each other some. And then skiing started, and we skied a little bit, and he went home for Christmas vacation to his home in Massachusetts, and I went home to Colorado, and we both trained, and he fell and broke his back and didn't come back for about three months. I think I'm, I'm here for Chris. I. Uh, I love to be outside, I love to do all these things, but in reality, I would never plan this trip for myself. And I look at Chris, and this will be a huge accomplishment. Initially, I wanted to help out a ton. I just wanted to be there for him, carry whatever I could. But as soon as I found out about the trip, I realized there was a lot bigger deal than that and sometimes the most support you can give someone is emotional, not physical. Climb in my mind is best divided into kind of days, and the increments were about three, 3,000 feet a day, 10 miles a day, roughly. The first day is from the main gate up to the Mandara huts, which is all in the trees, very beautiful, very lush. And then from there, for the first half mile or so, you climb, and then it gets dry. And you're out of the trees, and you see the mountain for the first time, and you realize how far it is away. It was such a distinctive line. It was literally like going out the door of your house kind of thing. Like you open the door, you're in the forest here, you're out of the forest. Emerging from the forest. 
And, uh, and that's when we could see the mountain for the first time with the little skull cap of snow up there and everything. So you could finally see where you were going. It's a volcano and it's got volcanic dust all over it. And when you step in the dust, it creates a little explosion and the dust kicks up. And if you're walking, it's kind of a pain in the neck because it gets all over you and you get dirty. But if you're on the hand cycle, you're right down in it. Chris's face was kind of 18, 24 inches off the ground. And as we're moving rocks out of the way or adjusting things where the bike's kicking up dirt, you know, he was getting it all right in his face and it couldn't have been that pleasant. <laughs> Every time we saw somebody coming down the mountain, they would say, you know, this is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Which it may or may not have been, or it may have been a little melodramatic just coming off the mountain, but then they'd see Chris and it kind of changed them completely. And I, don't, I think everybody that was coming off the mountain seeing Chris go up kind of made them reassess how hard things actually were. And it was kind of fun to see that. I think it is a matter of visibility. Going up the mountain, I went by numerous people and they said, everybody's talking about you. Everybody on the mountain's talking about you. So does that minimize that sense of, of invisibility? Yeah, it totally does. Uh, is, is it something that's kind of ongoing and, and continues? Yeah, definitely. Those people on the mountain know who I am or what I'm all about because we're sharing the same, the same struggle. Nice to see you. You're doing wow. fantastic. Oh, uh, thank you much. Thank How do you, you. feel? Uh, a little tired. A little tired. Yeah, yeah. A little dirty. A little dirty. The stretch is very dirty too. Are you up or down? Or We're down. down. We made it. We went oh, to congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. This is my Good for you. Kevin. I don't I know you know. They would stop. Chris would talk to them. And they'll probably remember it just as much as Chris will remember it. In fact, we talked to so many people, I know Chris will forget it. But each one of those people, I think, will remember Chris forever. That'll be great. All right. Enjoy the top. Okay. Thanks, we will. <laughs> but I think that we take a little chunk out of that invisibility. I think that we look at it and say, here's something that someone did. And really, I hope that people, people look at, at the next person with a disability that they see, and it's not a matter of, oh, that's too bad. Look at what you've lost. It's like, well, what are you going to do?
It's like boxing. You can have whatever plan you want until you get hit in the face, and then things change a little bit. And I think Chris kind of got hit in the face a little bit that day. What, you know, this isn't going to be easy, and there's going to be a lot of challenges. I think he knew they were, but you know, you can talk about challenges, and then you can get hit by them, and it's a little different. Cool. The big one that comes to mind is the fact that Chris is a paraplegic. He did get sick this past winter, and. You know, everyone gets a chance to deal with their mortality on a personal basis, but sometimes it's pushed onto you. And I think that that was a real big thing for Chris this winter. And it makes you adjust and realize what's important. He had to put some things on hold this trip. It's having to all of a sudden sit in the hospital and realize that nothing's, nothing's going to go how you expect it. Chris has a great perspective on life, but when things like that happen to you, and I can't put myself in Chris's shoes, but it really opens up your perspective on life. So what we're doing today is we're going up the trail, I think we can see right here, around the corner and at the base of the mountain is the Kibo hut. Tomorrow is a potential rest day. Then we go up the white line we can see on the right side into the cloud. That's the crater rim. We'll drop into the crater just a hundred feet or so, go around in the crater, come back up into that cloud and there's snow and that's the summit of the mountain. And that'll be, uh, hopefully day after tomorrow, we'll get up there and head on down the trail. Today he's cruising. I don't, he's miles ahead of us right now, so <laughs> we're gonna have to catch up. But he says he's feeling great, nothing with altitude, and he's eating well and drinking a lot. We're sleeping at over 15,000 feet. So this is where things will start to show up. If people have headaches, trouble breathing, this is where altitude really starts to kick in. And we've come up to this altitude in three days, which is pretty quick. So the plan is to take a rest day at 15 and then start moving up. And uh, my, my good, my good dad, with the, the I don't know. Uh, he's bending? Yeah, he's bending me, guys. Right. Oh, no. Right, uh, uh, up the right, the top, right, right, down, yeah. right, right. Down, down. It's bending, huh? Yeah, it is bending, right. But, uh, but I think that I must go to other way to a step, step other, go to slow, slowly go to the gap. It's the best go to get right. right. You can do it. Yeah. Right, okay, right? Yeah. Right. Well, just to be clear, you're going to go to the next camp yeah. and, and fix, fix this? Yes, yeah. You, you can fix it? I can fix it, fix it, yeah. Right. I can fix it if you go to the camp. I want to fix it, right? I know that it will be good to get to give me another go to the another another camp.
Chucky. Yeah. Roger up, Chris. Thank you, Zeki. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Karibu, Chris. Thank you, the jury. Thank you. It was good. Yeah, I get that. Much, much, much. Thanks. Yeah. Chris, go get up. Thank you, sir. Where we? Mugumu. Wait, wait, need Gungumu. Gungumu is strong. We call all these guys Wahumu. Yeah, so again, very strong people. Gungumu. So, now where we? Well, you. Ah, Gungumu. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Makofu Bas Jamani. Thank you. Manjaro Bomba. Bomba, it's a public attempt at this mountain. And it's a public attempt to, to make a statement. Uh, you know, it's a, but it's also, we, we've all sacrificed a lot to be here. And I think that's part of it. I think, but I think, but I think part of it also is just, you know, my, my life in general. You know, to see where I'm going and what I'm doing, and can I achieve the simple sense of 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 life? I mean, is this is this something that that pursuing this project brings me closer to people, or or if it separates me more from people? And it's been pretty all encompassing. The goal leaving Kibo was to make it to the summit and then return to Harambo. That was my goal. Other people had different perspectives on what might happen, but that was my goal. And as I left, we were on this little path, and things didn't feel quite as easy as I hoped that they would feel. I mean, always at that point, you feel like you're kind of approaching what's going to be difficult. You want it to feel easy. Didn't feel as easy. Stay on for a little while. Do we get a break here at all, or is it pretty much consistent like this? Is it? Okay. All right, just take a break. I'm gonna stay on the winch, I think, and then I'm gonna take a little break. We're moving. Moving up. I think we'll be using all the camps. We'll stop at uh, Hans Meyer today, go to the crater tomorrow, and then see how quickly we descend here. Yeah. It seems like the boards are more efficient, and it's kind of like what they call a rest step in climbing, where you move a couple steps and rest. Let's wait a little. We need to wait a little. I can't move. Oh well. Where's the little rub? We got onto the winch, and because it got steep okay. and it got and it got soft, and this was going to be the way that we would deal with all of this for the rest of the way up. And the winch just didn't work. We're going back to boards. Okay. It's starting to seize. The winch is frozen. Yeah, I got it.
This has been a first gear day. Nothing but. I'm tired. It's steep and it's high. Yeah, we had some trouble with the winch down there, so we're back on the boards. Basically, we'll see what's the matter with it, but it, the resistance in the winch went way up. So not only was Chris pulling himself up, but he was pulling against the very tight winch, so making it harder than it had to be on him. And he was still going, but we've got to figure it out before we go any further. Thank you. The winch seized up, <laughs> and I don't know why. And I'm uh, taking it apart, and something inside here is seized because it won't move, and is just binding. And I've got a wrench that fits this that I can't find, so it's just a bit frustrating right now. I'm not sure he can climb without it, too. So. Where would I put the So going. And, uh, tough when it gets steep, but okay. not bad. We we went off the winch, and at this point, there's there's a total adrenaline rush for me, because with the winch not working, I thought that might be it. You know, this might be this is our shot to make it to the top. And if the winch isn't going to work, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> At the very end, I can see you know, the porters have gone and they've, they've set our tents and everything. We're going to sleep at about 17.5 or so. So we've done about 2,000 feet of vertical up some really steep, loose stuff. And I can see them about 30 feet away. And I don't think I can make it there. And the thought that kept going through my head is, this is sort of what it must feel like to, to drown within, within like reach of shore. This one's gonna be tough. This one's gonna be tough. Uh, okay, let's get one under here. Get rid of this one. Take this one out. Really deep, push in. Yeah, push down. Yeah, we'll just keep it like that, and then they, yeah. when they start going, then yeah. push down. Let me let me go backwards. I'm just gonna go over to there. Right here. Yeah. You, you're gonna go, but um, go I can go backwards and then turn and go straight. So go down a little bit, and then straight. That's the that's the trail right there, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think we're going to make this part is the issue. Let me try you. Is, is it so? Yeah. Well, it's the rock and then it's going sideways, so I keep going sideways more. So let's clear the rocks right here. Because if you're going to go there, again, coming up like this, very steep as well, and it's very challenging. You think? Yeah. Let me tell you. Oh, we, yeah. Yeah. Okay. we can try to go straight here. I don't know. Okay, the other thing is, push it in hard, and then and then low. Because the thing is, at the start, it's really hard. I don't think I'm going to get on that. Yeah, just one, just one. Just one, two of us. Okay, okay. Let's just keep going. 
Effectively, I'm running a marathon at this point. I'm like on the verge of a red line. But it was like taking this diversion and having to go climb, climb some embankment and just everything I could do just to get back on the board. So I'm, I'm looking, I'm like 30 feet away. I don't think I can make it. I just kept pedaling and eventually I ended up getting there. We got some big stuff to fight off tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow's no. just as big. I want to say it only one more time and I'll shut up after that, but <laughs> you might want to consider getting out of the seat. Yeah. Really? Uh, I don't see how. I really? Know. Both Nate and I looked all over. And I, I, I think it's great if you pull it off, but fours and winch, all that, it's going to be tough. Really? Well, we'll see. I, I mean, I think you're going to do it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> you're going to figure it out. I think we're going to need to be pretty creative and inventive, but I think we're going to make it work. Take a look at where you came from. Yeah, I know. The funny thing about Kibo is it looks like it's right there. Kibo does not look like it's right there to me. <laughs> well, you can still see it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I went off and walked back down, and it took a long time. We got some tents up there and got in the tents and tried to pass a good night. I think some slept more than others. I didn't sleep at all. I mean, we had a lot of fun in the tent that night, to be honest with you. We played, um, you know, sort of altitude-encumbered trivial games in the tent for a few hours, and that was a lot of fun. And, you know, I'm sure it was a special night for Nate and Chris and I, and nobody will ever know what happened in the tent that night. <laughs> any, any, uh, any words? Any words? Yeah. Bob? Uh, words? Just trying to stay warm. Good soup. Corn chowder is always appreciated, 18,000 feet. I think it's the... the Super choice, isn't it? Sure. 18,000 footers. Bob, any, any words? Yeah, where are we staying on the other end of this when we go out? Because I'm thinking of upgrading us. <laughs> <laughs> I, all I want is a shower I want a and shower a real toilet. A nice toilet and a nice bed. I'm telling you, that that cut up uh, five gallon... Uh, Five gallon bucket? That was the like, most comfortable toilet I've had here. Oh, God. That's great. That, this, this video will be utilized. I'm here we are. That is where we came from. I like the way they put the two tiles in there so you can stand properly. The idea of vulnerability. It, in some ways, it comes from the accident. Because as I break my back, then I can't use my legs. And, and, and the image that people have is this image of a broken person. You know? And it's like, oh, well, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, it's like, you're vulnerable. I think I reacted so much to that idea of vulnerability that I completely dismissed it. That, that I was like, no, I'm not, no. I can do whatever I want to do. But I think it was such a, a complete pursuit of not being vulnerable that, that I lost a lot of the things that, that, are, that are sort of important. You know, the sense of, the sense of being vulnerable, the sense of needing somebody else, the sense of not being able to do everything by yourself. Uh, but but it was so funny because you know because the thought is well you can't do this and I'm like let me show you. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Saki. How are you? Very good. Good good. good. So are we following the the rope or are we just, just in the rope? So we kind of go sharp. When the winch went, I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'm just going. I'm just going hard. I'm going as hard as I can. I, I abused myself yesterday. I'm really hoping that this winch works. Because I don't, I, don't, I don't know that I could do again today what I did yesterday. I think I went too deep yesterday. 
I really do. I think I just, I, I didn't recover and we slept at 17,500 feet or something like that, so you know. And today was so much of trying to find a rhythm and the winch worked significantly better than it's worked, you know, the rest of the time that, that we've been here. It didn't seize up, but still the progress was excruciatingly slow. And it was really, it was really hard for me. I was working really hard to, I mean, I was literally looking at a rock 10 feet away saying, okay, keep going until you get to that rock. And then there were other times that I was saying, okay, well, just a hundred revolutions. I was just trying to turn over whatever I could turn over. Chris is coming up, we're getting into the crux here. It's a few hundred feet of super technical terrain that we're not quite sure how Chris is gonna ride through. We're probably gonna give him a little bit of assistance just to get to the crater rim. Then we're gonna <clears throat> drop into the crater and have a camp in the crater tonight. Tomorrow, we'll be able to summit. There's no obstacles like this. Um, in the way, it's just altitude and distance. And then down to Harambo, which we were hoping to get to tonight. So we're just extending a day. He's doing well, he's tired. Getting really tired, but, and the altitude. But he's, uh, he's cranking away. <laughs> it's incredible. It's funny, last night in the, uh... In the tent, I'd been talking to Nate and Bob, and they'd been out and, and kind of hiked around on the uh, hiked around up on up on Gilman's and stuff like that. And 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 Bob said to me that, and uh, you know, I said, "There's there's no way that you're gonna make it." Important to me, it was gonna be Chris's decision for anything that was. I mean, Chris was sort of leading the thing. I think people were individually having conversations with Chris and individually having conversations among themselves. But ultimately, the decision for assistance had to be Chris's. You know, we kind of reached that point where it was getting so steep that, that the rope was completely taut and, and was basically from the rock straight to me. And I could feel the day slipping away. And I think at that point, I kind of I kind of made peace with the idea of not making the summit unassisted. We're stuck here. We don't go to the crater camp. Exactly. And this is pretty much either turn around here right. or find a way to get to the crater camp. Yeah. Those so, are the two choices. Exactly. And I, my opinion is, is that we help you through this one section. Yeah. And then you're riding again on your own. And I'm, I'm working really, really hard. Exactly. And not going anywhere. Right. Right. And it's, I can't do any more than 15 revolutions. And then rest. And then rest for right. probably an equal amount of time to what I just pedaled. Right. So. Yep. Well, um, you know, it's it's like climbing. Climbing a mountain, you get to sections where you have to aid climb, and yeah. you just get yourself through however you possibly can. And I think as far as the climb goes, summit is what we're after. And we mark a section that you were assisted. You want to do the assistance? Okay, with, now <laughs> that's the question, right? Yeah. Um, I want to keep you on a rope. Yeah. 
I think for now, probably if you keep reeling in the rope and we just help you, let's okay. see how that works. Okay. Because this is a good system as far as. You well, know, plus I'm locked in, I'm not going to go anywhere. Exactly. Okay. So let's just see what that feels like first and get you up a ways. And then we'll see if we can't get you onto a, a real trail. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking that's, let's try that first. Yeah, because it's going to get cold. It's going to get. It is. It's going to get just, late. Just, it's like 1130 now. And yeah. We want to be in camp by, you know, 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, yeah. Okay. 4 o'clock at the outside. Right, yeah. I agree. So, shifting gears. So you look at this next step, Chris. Yeah. We gotta find a way through that. Well, we need to get the crater rim, but what I'm thinking is if this is somewhere around 17,950, crater rim is somewhere around 18,000. So we're helping him for about 100, you know, we'll get a reading over there. 100 vertical feet out of the 13,000 is what we're helping. So I'm going to go help. We okay? Yeah. Okay, is Chris ready? What are we doing? So, we'll go to Gilman. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go to So, the guys are ready to get it, Chris. How are we doing this? What are we doing? I'd like to know, please. He's, he stays on right now. Okay. Right? Uh -huh. He's well, asking you can. a question. Yeah. He's asking you a question. So Chris stays in the bicycle now? Well, carrying him would be easy. Easier? Yes. <laughs> and we are ready to do that. Okay. Okay. We can roll then we can. until we have to carry. All right. Okay. Then we can do that as well. Right? Yeah. What do you think? All are possible for us. Yeah, I think that makes I have no idea what's up here, so. Right. I, There's just going to be a point where we're in the rocks and it fit with the rim. And tomorrow, from the camp, you can ride to the summit. Hey, you want to touch and then you'll ride back, and then we'll have to get you down yeah. through this. Yeah. Okay, we can drag him first and keep going, keep going until we get to the point we can. Okay, okay let's do that. Right. Okay. Let's keep the train moving. Yeah. All right, let's go. Okay. The time is moving. Yep.
Kila hivi una moyo huko. Na huyu na moyo hivi ni kabili ni kani raga pia. Greater rim. It's flatter down there than it's been all day, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. Yes? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. When you're ready, Chris, nice to throw both brakes. Okay. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
because I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we. I don't know what we get out of this. Yeah. Well, I guess in my opinion, is it's just that one little section, and that's the story. Is that you will yeah. make it, you know, the whole way, the rest of the way. And yeah. there's one little section that is not doable. It's impassable right it's now. It's impassable with a hand cycle at this point in time. Yeah. And you've done more than anyone. You'll have gotten higher than anyone. Right. That's my opinion. I had this, this kind of vision in my mind of, of how we'd of how we'd do it, you know, and I wanted to ride to that point where, where we couldn't get through it. In my mind, the point was a whole heck of a lot smaller than, than it really was. And, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do like a, like a wheelbarrow effectively with, with Dave, you know, and because he's been such an integral part of this whole thing. And, uh, you know, in, in all of my efforts and everything. And, and I wanted to share that with him. I think this mountain has galvanized a lot for us, for all the people who are working on this project. And if we go from here to the summit tomorrow, you know, what that, what that means. And, and I'm not sure yet what that means. And, you know, I've said this is, a, this is a journey and a lot of things happen along the way. And, Sometimes you figure them out a little bit later or something, but uh, that's kind of the last couple of days. Thank you for okay. staying with us. Right. Okay. Good. Right. Good. Right. So in the morning, I mean, literally, we can see we can see the post with the summit. I mean, the summit is we've got to go back up to the rim in order to go around the rim to get up to the summit. And the summit looks like it's like, it's right there. I mean, we're at like 18,000 feet or something like that. So we've, we have you know, 1,300 feet or something left. And it was hard right from the beginning. You keep thinking, it's gonna get easier. It's just, it's steep and it's loose and I'm back on the boards and I'm, I'm just pedaling along and I'm trying to create this diversion in some ways. I'm looking at the glacier and the glacier that looked like this tiny little skull cap bottom when we came out of the rainforest that second day. Now suddenly it's like stories high and it's dramatic and, and then there's, there are all these clouds sort of billowing out from the crater. And I venture a little bit with Seki at this point. Like, okay, so when I get there, will I be able to see the summit? And he's like, oh yeah, you'll be able to see the summit. I didn't ask the follow-up question of like, how far will it be to the summit? I just wanted to know, okay, I can see the summit and I'm accepting that. I accepted I could see the summit and it could still be another six hours. We need a jacket. And I get there and it's all of like 300 yards to the summit, and I think, wow. And so for the first time in three days, I shifted out of first gear because it kind of dipped just a little bit. And as I'm approaching the summit, I'm remembering some of what Nate said, because Nate had gone to the summit and he had hiked in, in Nepal as well, and he said that the Nepalese, that nobody, out of respect for the mountain, they don't go to the true summit. It's not like you conquer the mountain. And so, uh, so, so I'm going up there and, and I kind of, it was, I was conscious of the true summit, conscious of what Nate had said, but it was also this moment with the, with the mountain. For me, it was just sort of this communion with the mountain of, thank you. You know, just thank you for what you've taught me. Thank you for 
you know, for allowing me to get to the top, for allowing me to have this moment. Thank you, Tajiri. You too. Twice in two days, not so bad, man. Penny, you should come up here. I don't care what these guys say. We're close enough without being on it. This is at least two years of training. Thanks, man. Whoa. <laughs> okay, he's gone. Thanks, man. Off the back end. <laughs> also, I still have this worry of like, the perception, you know, the perception from the outside. I know that in my own mind, the, the sense of team is something that, that's really important. It's something that, that I needed to learn as I was going up. And I was like, what is it, what is it going to mean? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Thanks for joining us again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what I realized is that climbing this mountain, it's like, for me to, to, to say that I climbed it myself is complete fantasy because there were so many people who worked so hard. I mean, Isaac coming to, to our tent to bring us our food in the morning, the porters carrying all the gear, carrying all the food, all the tents, laying the boards down, doing all this stuff. I'm just like, I'm not doing this by myself. And what I realized is that I actually, that I needed people. And, and the idea of making it to the top on my own would perpetuate a lot of what I was trying to eliminate because I was trying to eliminate the sense of separation. And if I don't need anybody, then I'm separate. And so the realization, like Dave came into the, into the tent, and sure, for him, it's just one of those things that he wanted it as much as I did, and probably more so in a lot of ways. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. This is, it's, it's not your fault. This is, this, is, this is what we're doing. I mean, he was the one who put the whole rig together. Like, without that, I couldn't have even thought about climbing this whole thing. Chris is a, it's an amazing guy. I can say that because he did the thing which is uh, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And he did a great job and he, everyone is happy to see, to be together with him and uh, to reach the top together with him. It's a good thing. As I was going up, I was like, what is it, what is it going to mean? What is it going to mean in the future? And and I looked and I, and I saw Tajiri, that this is a guy who, who made it, who was the first leg amputee from Tanzania to make it to the summit of Kilimanjaro. And he's gonna change people's perspectives as a result of that. That's exactly what I was hoping for. He summited the mountain again and, well, he's proud of that, that he summited again. The way he was after losing his legs, and before climb, and the way he's gonna be now, after this climb, we change his life a lot. Because he couldn't believe that he can do it. But he made it to say, okay, this is possible. <laughs>